Well, Andrew, let's start with Chaldean. What a brilliant start to the season. Um, well, actually, it's probably a slightly less than brilliant start to the season with him, but brilliant result in the Guineas. How's he been since then? How pleased have you been with his development? Yeah, very good. I, I mean, he's had a quiet time after the Guineas. I thought he had a hard race. Um, and he did his first little faster piece yesterday, um, upsides, and was was bouncing this morning. So, yeah, we're pretty happy with him. And, uh, you know, all, all roads lead to Royal Ascot and will increase the intensity over the next sort of fortnight and hopefully get, get him there in the same shape he was at Newmarket. Just looking back to the 2000 Guineas and, and how big a day that was for the team, uh, one that will live long in the memory, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, the Classic's a big deal, particularly the Guineas, to, to get it that early in the season is is a huge effort. And it was more of a relief, to be honest, because I think having won the Dewhurst, you sort of go spend the whole winter with high expectations and uh, you get there and it was it was rather more of a relief than feeling of ecstasy but uh you know great one to get on the board and everyone was was rightfully very happy with themselves Chaldean on the far side out in front the Dewhurst winner in the hands of Frankie Dottori in his final season and he wins another guineas Chaldean he's a fascinating horse did he did he surprise you because it feels like he's surprised and maybe crept up on on observers and fans of the sport uh not particularly I mean he, he showed a lot of well, he was showing good promise here before he ran. He may fall, so we started him a little later. Um, and he, he was a bit unlucky, learnt a lot on his debut and then won well and just he kept improving with each race. But I, I think, you know, he was impressive in the Acom. The form of that's pretty strong always and uh, very impressive at Doncaster. And then obviously we went into the, the Dewhurst with, with high hopes and, you know, he, he got the race won in spite of idling probably slightly in the last third of the race but he's a he's just a lovely horse to have around he's so professional um, and talented as well yeah and it's a hard race to assess and I know kind of time form analysts and people have struggled to assess the guineas in terms of where horses in behind do you have every confidence going forward now that there's more to come from this horse that he's gonna really stamp his authority on this classic generation well I'd, I'd hope so but obviously it's a long season and he's you know he's got a lot of hard fights ahead of him all we can do is get him in the best shape we can and hope he can do the rest. St James's Palace, all systems go for Ascot? Uh, St James's Palace, that is the obviously intended target and hopefully, I mean, the, the chance now he's going to have to encounter some faster ground at some stage. I haven't got a concern myself and um, on that it was quite fast when he won at York. Um, but I think all ground comes alike to him and uh, I think it, Ascot, the round track there, should really play to his strength. So. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Well, Ed, what a journey Chaldean has taken you on as breeders. Just take us back, if you can, to, to the early days when he was foaled on the farm and what, what's he been like to deal with? Well, it was a bit of a 50-50 decision to, to breed the mare at that late uh, time of the season. You know, we were getting um, into June, uh, so it, it, it was a sort of uh, toss of the coin as to whether we would send her back for a cover. Um, so luckily we took that decision. So he was a very late foal. He was the last foal born on the stud that year. Uh, so he got a lot of attention, not just because he was a Frankel foal out of a very nice mare of ours, but because he was the last one by quite some way. Um, so maybe because he's just a friendly soul anyway, or because he got a lot of attention, he, he was very natural around people from the start. And did he take your eye out straight away? I mean, he's by Franco, the pedigree's there. Was he always a standout? Um, people love to sound clever, don't they, when they, when they say that. But um, he always had that sort of look, you know, very confident horses often look smart, don't they? And he was unbelievably confident and always had lovely movement. The mare does pop them out pretty smart ones. Yeah, she's she's a, a bit of a golden mare to have, so... Um, but no, we were very happy from day one. You'd already had a bit of a, a view as to the type of horses she's producing. She'd produced some very nice ones on the track, but this was the first Frankel. What did you see in, in him of the mare's side of the family or indeed of the, of the Frankel genetics? She's not a big mare. Um, she'd be one of our small mares, but she's so pretty. She's probably our prettiest mare. And um, I just thought she needed a bit of size and scope. Um, and Frankel obviously does that. Uh, we've bred a couple of good showcasings out of her, which is great to make the most of the speed in her pedigree, but um, to maybe get more of a book one type obvious uh, yearling, you know, Frankel, which has put a bit more scope in. 
and it was a big step up. Obviously, she she very much merited that. But um, getting that kind of opportunity to go to Frankel, was it then a very difficult decision to sell a horse like that and, and bring bring him to the sales? Yeah. Yeah, normally it probably would be for, for, for most people, but uh, we're really trying to get a reputation for selling a real quality type of foal at the sales. Sometimes the best time to sell is when, it, when it's an agonising decision. Uh, that's when you, know, you really raise the interest of the market. So we really try and push ourselves to, to sell the ones that maybe other people wouldn't choose to sell as foals. That might give us the point of difference. Um, so yes, it was a difficult decision, but it's one we want to keep making. You have made that subsequent with the mayor. She's now bankrolling through the, through the sales so far. How long may it continue? But at the time, were you pleased with that result? Did you value him at that, or did that exceed expectations? Well, we really appreciated John Mont uh, su supporting us and, and, and buying him at the time. Uh, we were even happier for them when they've gone in again and bought the half-sister Kingman last year at the Foal Sales for a lot of money. So they deserve all the success they're getting with him. Um, you know, she's, she's just becoming, you know, the superstar of the stud really now. And, you know, we want to wrap her up in cotton wool. Um, but no, they're very welcome to keep buying them. Yeah, and she, she is a fantastic mare, as you say. But, and it's not quite a rags to riches story, but it's quite an interesting story as to how you acquired this mare. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about how she ended up with you guys. It's almost rags to riches. Um, 21,000 is a lot of money in the real world, but to buy a mare you know, th th that would still be in the cheaper bracket. Um, Dad had handed it over the reins to me at that stage and had promised not to buy any more horses and leave it up to me. But I, I strolled up to uh, the shoot at Tats and he came out and said, oh, hope you don't mind a bought a mare. Uh, luckily, I didn't castigate him for it because <laughs> I wouldn't live that down. Um, but he explained what it was because he'd had a bit of luck with the family maybe 20 years previous. And um, yeah, the last mare he bought, and the only one in sort of 10 years, is, is a superstar. So he's basking in his, yeah. uh, his success, I imagine. What's it been like as a journey as a family, to, although you sold, sold this horse, Chaldean, to watch his career develop? Well, he was so friendly and such a beautiful foal, and a young foal still in the summer, uh, because he was born late that he was probably the first foal that we really got the younger generation of my friends and family in, come and have a look at this foal. Um, my nieces, um, who wouldn't be brought up around the horses, um, they're more in London direction. Uh, they came to, me to meet him and remember him well. Uh, my goddaughter came and, and gave him a pat on the head and you know, that's the only foal she's met. So it's really sparking interest am amongst sort of family and friends who wouldn't be in, in racing because we, we took a lot of photos, so it's nice to have them as well at home. Certainly is, and he's just gone from strength to strength as a racehorse. I know he was always held in high regard, but what sort of noises were you hearing from, from the Buildings before he ran and from the Judmont team? Were you always confident or did he almost take you by surprise? Absolutely. I was hearing nothing. I'm not in the know <laughs> on those sort of things. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't blown away by his first two starts. Um, he looked like a nice horse, but I, I'm obviously no uh, judge of a race, but um, he's just amazing how he keeps improving and loving his racing. Um, he, he looks like he really enjoys the job and um, yeah, long may that continue. We saw what he did as a two-year-old. He stamped his authority on that generation, but how was Guinea's day for you? Because there's something extra special about getting a, a classic on the board. Yeah. Um, it, it just never stopped raining and you know <laughs> you're standing there in the pre-parade ring shivering and thinking of all the things that are going to go wrong especially with his previous race in the in the green and, and just you know i'm a bit doom and gloom before a race starts and um you know with a furlong to go i couldn't see him getting beaten and i was screaming and yelling and i feel sorry for the people that were around me in the seats um, but yeah, I didn't feel cold and wet after that. That was it was fantastic. I bet. And I guess when you're breeding, you've been decades in the industry, and your family before you, you get kind of used to these horses running and used to disappointments and used to successes as well. But was that day something like you'd never felt before? Did it feel different um, with a horse like yeah, this? I think it's justification of my father's hard work for yeah. 50 years. Yeah. Fantastic. Well done. Coltrane certainly ticks a lot of boxes for the Gold Cup. I mean, he looks better than ever when we saw him at Ascot last time. You must have been really thrilled with the development he's made from five to six. 
yeah, he's a, he's a bit of a star. I mean, he wasn't an expensive yearling. He's been a pleasant surprise from day one, really, um, in everything he's done. He looked absolutely stone cold useless as a two year old, to be honest. <laughs> you know, I mean, he could hardly get up to the top of the gallop. Um, and just improved and improved uh, and has improved with racing and obviously had a setback at the end of his well beginning of his four-year-old career missed a lot of that uh, and the way he's come back is an absolute tribute to his um, his steel he's just a, a fabulous horse to train and uh, I thought he was very impressive in the Cigaro so uh, you know if he can produce that sort of performance um, at, at Ascot um, on Gold Cup Day he's he's got to be a player. He seems to have so many strings to his bow as well. Just go on any ground, you know, stays, is a relentless galloper, but got a bit of pace. Is there an ideal scenario you'd like to see for Gold Cup Day or does it all come alike for a horse like him? I, I think that that's, the, as you, you know, you rightly say there, he seems so versatile in terms of the way the race could be run in the in the term of the, the terms of the ground. So, um, you know, we, we're pretty relaxed about it. If we can just get in there in in, in his best health, uh, he's got to have a chance. He always gives his running, but is he better than ever this year from what we saw last time? Well, I think certainly last run yeah. suggests he is. I, I thought he was very impressive. He put in a similar performance actually at Sandown last year, um, you know, where he'd looked very, very good. Um, and we, we were just thrilled with the way he won at Ascot. So it was obvious that he, we didn't need to be running again before the Gold Cup, um, you know, because there's a busy time after that as well. So. Uh, hopefully, as I say, if we can get him there in the same form, he should be, uh, you know, have a great chance. You mentioned he wasn't an expensive yearling. I think 50 grand, wasn't he? Obviously, he qualified for that book one bonus, so he's immediately made that back. How did you pick him out going back to that time? What were you looking for in, in the horse at that stage? Well, we were always looking for, for Mick and Janice. We we're always looking for something with a, that represents a bit of value, you know, something that, that we can, um, you know, you buy essentially for... for a reasonable price and have the ability to sell it for more you know at some stage during his racing career that's you know basically what we were trying to achieve and uh, we're particularly looking for a couple of staying horses um, obviously with the markets opening up in Australia and and you know the jump market as well it's it's quite a good resale if you don't get a Coltrane and you get something not just below that level that there's still a good out at the end of the day um, so that's essentially what we were looking for but he really has exceeded all our expectations and uh, you know it's very lucky usually we've for, for Mick and Janice we've traded very well in the past but we couldn't trade him obviously because uh, because he was injured so you know we're incredibly lucky still to have him and we'll have him until his career is over I'd say. Well Mick it's great to get up close and personal with with Coltrane maybe a little bit closer than you're <laughs> than you're maybe comfortable with but you have been doing the sales now for a number of years and getting close to these horses and picking them out as specimens with the with the boarding team. What is it exactly that appealed about him? Because he was an inspired purchase. He's he's the third master craftsman that we've owned. The other two uh, were both uh, very good horses, so it wasn't difficult for us to to look at a master craftsman. Um, we didn't buy him based on the page. We we've been taught by Emma in particular that you look at the animal rather than the page. Um, so he was, he was uh, from a sire that we like, uh, relatively at that time unfashionable, and he was, um, he was, he, he was the type of horse that we buy. Yeah. So he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a hard buy. No, but he was only 50,000, yeah. and based on what he's achieved, it was an inspired purchase. You're looking in book one, so you're swimming in big waters. You've mentioned the sire. What's the process like for you then? What do you look, look for? What's the brief going into the sale with, um, with the team? I, I mean, the brief is the budget, really. Um, Andrew and the team know what kind of horse we're looking for. We, we tend to go for, for horses uh, that like a longer trip. Um, there's more value there for us. If you look to his page, um, he's not the deepest page and that's fine for us. Emma in particular always says to us, you buy the horse, not the page. And uh, he's a prime example. You've had a great deal of success with the boarding team and you, you've, you've been doing the legwork at the sales for years now. Has the profile of horse changed that you, that you now um, target? Not really. We, we mix it up a little. We will go for horses that, that, that take a shorter trip. Um, we still know next to nothing. I mean, you know, <laughs> we're learning every year. Um, I, I think, true to say, Janice and I know what we like. So we, if we like a horse, then 
you know, we will, we will fight for that one. But we would never dream of trying to say that we know more than the, the people who really know what they're yeah. doing. Talk us through what the journey's been like with this horse, because <laughs> it's been had its ups and downs as much yeah. as he's been an uber consistent, fantastic horse. Yeah, he has. Um, he was he was broken by someone called uh, Katie Lyons, who loved him to bits. Um, but he was the last horse of our string to come to Andrew. And the feedback from Andrew uh, as soon as he arrived was he's very, very, very slow. <laughs> and it, it got to the point where Andrew said, look, I'm going to have to put him on a race course. Um, but I think it might be embarrassing. And he turned up, came second, first time out. And he's never really looked back from then. He had a good three-year-old career. He won the Melrose. Um, and he came at, I think, a creditable um, eighth or ninth in the Cesarewitch. And then he got injured. And we honestly didn't know whether he was ever going to come back at all. Um, he reappeared back end of his four-year-old um, career on your weather and it's fair to say he didn't set the world on fire. Chester Cup onwards last year, he just got better and better. He really improved did. with every run. Um, and he's now, he's now part of the family. I mean, he's, he's one that we won't sell. As you well know, we are known for, for trading our horses. It's how we keep the whole thing afloat. But um, no, he's, he's part, of the, part of the family. So you're going into a Gold Cup now with, a, with a favourite's chance. I mean, what a, what a feeling. Does it, does it feel kind of pressurised with that kind of reputation going into a race like Ascot or something to enjoy, I guess? It, it, at the moment, it's enjoyable. Yeah. Um, on the day, I don't know, you'd have to ask me on the day. Uh, we generally don't like being favourite for anything. Um, and so part of me is hoping that something else comes along. He, he deserves his place and he deserves um, where he is in the betting market right now. Um, I mean, I just I hope we can just enjoy the day. There's, there's going to be lots of good horses there, and I hope he turns in a performance. And there aren't many who had a better season than he had last year. So I think he's he's definitely there on merit, and we you know we'll be proud of him whatever happens. You'll go back, no doubt, to, to Tassels this year. Is that book one and, and picking up horses in that value bracket something that you really prioritise? Yeah, I mean we've been lucky. The last two years we've done all of our. Um, buying in book one. Uh, it's tough because our, um, our budget is, is not a book one type budget, but we are looking for uh, possibly unfashionable horses, um, unfashionable sires, um, new sires, uh, and we've been able to do it. But if we don't do it at book one, we'll be at book two. So one way or another, we'll get it done. Tell us a little bit about the naming of this horse as well, because you always have really cleverly, <laughs> fantastically picked out names for the horses, but there was um, a sort of added dimension to the story in the naming. Uh, yeah, my son is a saxophonist, he's a musician, and one of his favourite saxophonists is John Coltrane, um, master craftsman, John Coltrane was a master craftsman, so uh, th that was where it came from. I think also there is a John Coltrane song that's got promise in it, so his damn is promise me. Um, there are people who think he's named after Robbie Coltrane, who's a, uh, a was a Scottish comedian. And in fact, um, he did win um, on a day on the day that Robbie um, passed away. So for that day alone, he was named after Robbie Coltrane. So he's 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 claimed it, an extra twist in the narrative yeah. of Coltrane. Well, hopefully, it ends with Gold Cup success, Mick. Best of Let's luck. Keep our fingers crossed.